Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here this evening. I made my first forecast for the public on KMBZ Radio in Kansas City in 1967. Since then, I've spent every day of my life forecasting the weather or creating applied meteorological solutions to real world problems. With that nearly 50 years perspective, tonight I want to talk a little bit about how meteorologists view ourselves and how the public views us and some changes I would like to see made. Just three months ago, in October 2015, certified broadcast meteorologist Jim Gandy worked 150 hours in just two weeks during the record Carolina floods. Jim and his colleagues not only provided 24-hour-a-day service during those floods, they did it even as the flood waters invaded the station, causing a half million dollars in damage, and even as they lost running water and the use of toilets inside the station. You may have also seen the news story about employees of the U.S. Geological Survey swimming to river gauges to make sure that they continued to report during the record floods. What was the death toll from this record flood event? 17. Now let's put that in perspective for a moment. In 1969, the remains of Hurricane Camille moved across the East Coast and the unforecast rains caused 160 deaths. The work of Jim, the National Weather Service, the other TV meteorologists, the U.S. Geological Survey, storm spotters, and all of the members of the integrated warning team saved at least 150 lives. In addition, private sector weather companies help abate millions of dollars of property damage. There is a word for that level of dedication and effectiveness at saving lives, and that word is heroic. Fast forward to Christmas week 2015. A blizzard in West Texas and Eastern New Mexico wiped out the dairy industry in that region when it killed 35,000 head of cattle. In addition, that same storm system caused record flooding in the state of Missouri that exceeded the 1993 totals and closed four cross-country interstate highways at a time of year when people are driving in unfamiliar territory. The storm also produced an ice storm, causing 100,000 homes and businesses to lose power, which meant that more than 35,000 people lost power, some for days right after Christmas in the extremely cold weather. And then there were the Christmas week tornadoes. From Tennessee to Texas, tornadoes occurred many after dark in densely populated areas. Many of those tornadoes occurred in darkness. In all of this extreme weather, the tornadoes, the blizzards, the floods, the ice storm, how many direct deaths do you think there were attributable to the storm? The answer, 37. 37. Now, while every death is a tragedy, that number is remarkably low considering the tens of millions of people that were in danger from the storms. Let's talk a little bit more about how all of this occurred. Part of it was technology. Doppler radar to see the tornadoes, dual polarization radar in order to measure how much rain was falling. But the main part of the achievement was due to talented and dedicated people. Christmas afternoon in Birmingham. At the National Weather Service, meteorologists came in on their day off without even being asked in order 
to make sure the people of Alabama were protected from floods and tornadoes. James Spann and other TV meteorologists came in on Christmas Day, rather than spending time with their families, in order to make sure people were warned as the tornado moved into Birmingham. When the tornado affected the track of two railroads, those railroads were able to move trains out of the path of the tornado when they were given more than 25 minutes advance warning. The next night in the darkness in Dallas, powerful tornadoes, one reaching EF4 intensity, struck densely populated suburbs. Television meteorologists came in on their day off. At the National Weather Service, the day shift stayed into the evening. One person came in voluntarily to help. At AccuWeather Enterprise Solutions, four meteorologists extended their shifts to 12 hours because of the workload so that we could provide effective warnings to Quick Trip, a railroad, and a solar panel manufacturing plant. The next day, a Sunday, extra National Weather Service employees were called in to do the grim work of surveying the damage path as a cold rain fell. Meteorologist and engineer Tim Marshall came in on his day off to help with the survey. Instead of going to church, instead of watching the Dallas Cowboys, instead of spending day after Christmas holiday time, meteorologists did what was needed. Tim Marshall took this photo via Facebook of a couple that, like so many, were saved because they took shelter after they heard the warning. But there's nothing new about meteorologists' incredible dedication. In 2005, the National Weather Service employees and their families in New Orleans literally lived at the forecast office for weeks after Hurricane Katrina as they forecast the storm and made assistance and provided assistance to the rescue and recovery efforts. Although not as dramatic as living at the office, television meteorologists and a private sector weather company in New Orleans had to endure terrible working conditions in order to fulfill their mission to get the word out. In the decade in between, there were literally dozens of other examples of meteorologists going beyond the call of duty. Let me cite another. On May 4, 2007, the city of Greensburg, Kansas was destroyed by a 1.7 mile wide tornado. The National Weather Service warning was superb. Storm chasers provided live coverage of the storm's approach. The town siren wailed until it was destroyed by the tornado. Greensburg officials had so much lead time that they drove the town's ambulance and fire trucks outside the path of the tornado. Television warnings were accurate, timely, and convincing. Dangerous tornado on the ground confirmed by National Weather Service spotters and by our high-resolution Nixrad Doppler radar. And as you look at this image, it is quite a picture. You can see here's Greensburg now. And if you uh, count off the city uh, county lines with me, of course, these are county sections, so one mile. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This tornado is only seven miles southwest of Greensburg. AccuWeather's warning for Union Pacific came, kept two trains out of the path of the tornado that otherwise would have been derailed when the storm hit. The warnings for Greensburg unquestionably saved more than 200 lives. But if these anecdotes are not enough to convince you that meteorologists save lives, I'd like to show you some graphs for comparison. For cancer, since 1950. This is the death rate. For traffic safety, since 1950, the death rate per 100,000. And going back to 1920, the death rate per million from tornadoes. We have cut the death rate from tornadoes by 97%. The meteorologists, hydrologists, storms chasers and storm spotters in this room save thousands of lives every year. Let's give them a round of applause.
Given this unparalleled level of dedication, one would think our profession would enjoy in American society the level of esteem of, say, doctors and firefighters. Unfortunately, I don't believe that's the case. The public rarely, if ever, thinks about the work of meteorologists, and if they do, they largely take us for granted. Let me make one last comparison. Two years after the Greensburg tornado, Captain Chesney Sully Sullenberger ditched his plane in the Hudson River, saving his life, the lives of his crew, and the lives of the 120 passengers on the jet. The crew and Captain Sullenberger got to ring the opening bell on Wall Street. They were treated to a huge party in Hollywood and got to do the coin toss at the Super Bowl. Now, of course, Captain Sullenberger and his crew deserved all of the accolades that they received. Now, think back to the Greensburg tornado. Weather science saved nearly twice the number of people who were saved on the U.S. Airways flight. Here's my question. Where were the Super Bowl tickets for the members of the integrated warning team? I certainly didn't get mine, but it's worse than that. Rain, mixture of precipitation throughout the Albany area, up to an inch of rain. <laughs> Excuse me, up to an inch of snowfall is possible. <laughs> All right, so we'll have that mixed bag of precipitation and we'll have sunshine and a few clouds. The weatherman as clown causes contempt in some situations as the social media postings uh, while James Spann was on the air demonstrate. When we discuss increasing the effectiveness of the warning system, I believe that weatherman as bozo is a serious credibility issue, not just one of annoyance. Think about it. If you, why would you take your family out into a driving rainstorm to get the higher ground during a flash flood warning if you don't respect the meteorologist giving you the information? In the Dallas tornadoes two weeks ago, eight people died in five cars. We know that at least two of the drivers knew there was a tornado warning, but chose to ignore it. They then drove into the tornado. Could that be in part because of our image problem? I'm very pleased to have our social science colleagues on the case. I'm certain that they will provide insight that will make warnings issued by the entire profession more effective. But as they study the problem, I can't help but think there is a tie between the low credibility of storm warnings in the minds of some and our image problem. And finally, even when the media is trying to be helpful, they can't seem to help from tripping over themselves. How often do we hear there was no warning, even when there was plenty of warning? Or that the storm was unpredictable no matter how well it was forecast? Is the El Reno tornado. It's massive, fast, and unpredictable. Now I can tell you, if you don't live in the central United States, the El Reno tornado was incredibly well forecast. So much so, I was asked to do a news radio report the day before on the threat, and TV road signs in Oklahoma City showed the threat to drivers hours in advance. I believe it's past time that we stop com complaining amongst ourselves about these issues and do something to change them. My first suggestion is that we stop shooting ourselves in the foot. After last year's largely accurate forecasts of the northeastern blizzard, there were several meteorologists who, in my opinion, inappropriately apologized for what was largely an excellent forecast. Think about it. 
if the New York City forecast had been a perfect 9 to 12 inches, school would have still been called off, people would have been allowed to work from home, the city's snow plows would have been put on full alert, and flights still would have been canceled. The preparations for a perfect 9 to 12 inch forecast and the actual forecast of 20 inches were identical. The level of apology was unnecessary and counterproductive. We need to stop being defensive about largely accurate forecasts. Even when the forecast isn't perfect, if it's largely correct, we should be explaining, not apologizing. Secondly, I have a second mission, a new mission, to propose to both the Weather Coalition and the American Weather and Climate Industry Association, and that is the promotion of weather science to the general public. My suggested approach is twofold. The material sent out before each storm, tornado season, storm season, etc., should not only emphasize safety procedures, they should emphasize the value of the storm warning system and its credibility. My hope is the media will pick up on that information and write stories about it. The second part of my vision includes issuing a press release immediately after major storms that emphasizes the lives saved and the societal benefits created by the forecasts and warnings. Our colleagues in climate science have very successfully marketed catastrophic global warming. A press release comes out after every major storm, quoting an expert on how the storm was affected by or caused by global warming. We in applied meteorology need to market our profession just as effectively. While it will take time and effort to accomplish, I believe that these marketing efforts will pay off handsomely. By improving the image of our profession to the public and decision makers, I believe it will be easier to save additional lives, further reduce economic loss, and build political support to sustain and improve the infrastructure needed to make storm warnings in the United States second to none. After all, if we won't promote our profession, who will? Thank you very much.